Hello, everyone. My name is Sergey Heritonov. I'm a media expert at Vicense, and I'm very glad to have you all with me today on uh, our uh, presentation of uh, on a presentation uh, for um, Slovak Aid Fellowship Program for Change Leaders Initiative, which is a global uh, joint effort of Slovak Foreign Policy Association, Globsec Institute for Public Affairs, Slovak Aid, and International Expert Initiative, ISANS. I would like to greet our uh, distinguished guests uh, who are presented here today. Uh, Pavel Demesh, uh, um, who is GMF Senior Transatlantic Fellow and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovakia. Hello, Mr. Demesh. Uh, yeah. Mr. Ivan Miklos, former Deputy and Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of the Slovak Republic, uh, pr the President of Economic Think Tank, uh, MESA 10. Hello, Ivan. Hello, everybody. Mr. Ales Alekhnovic, uh, who is Svetlana Tikhanovska's economic advisor. Hello, Ales. Hello. And uh, last but not least, Ms. Veronika Laputska, co-founder of East Center and Warsaw and uh, research fellow at, at GMF Rethink C. Hello, Veronika. Hi, everyone. So the reason we are all gathered here is uh, our will to discuss the success of market reforms and political reforms of uh, Slovakia, which became uh, which became a regional uh, success in Europe and uh, showed a great example of economic growth and successful reforms in the uh, 90s and 2000s. We hope that the lessons that uh, Slovakia learned uh, will help Belarus build a sustainable and fast-growing economy in the upcoming decade. And although we all realize that at this particular time, no market reforms are yet possible in today's Belarus, we believe that um, the commitment that the people of Belarus expressed um, in their hope for peaceful transformation and political transit uh, will become a great uh, move that will support uh, reforms in the future. I would like to start with uh, 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 Pavel. Hello, Pavel. Yeah, uh, hi. Welcome and thanks for being with us here. Uh, my first question is about the illusions that the Slovak society had in early 90s, some of them broke, some of them uh, became truth and helped sustain reforms. What kind of illusions do you think Belarusians may have today about the future and um, what challenges they should be ready for on their way to transformations and reforms? Yeah, I, uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor to have this uh, bilateral uh, Belarus-Slovak uh, panel on screen in pandemic times and you, Sergei, moderating it, Ivan uh, Miklos and myself, we will be trying to tell a few things about Slovakia with which uh, Belarus started this initiative of having more intensive dialogue in this uh, very critical time for a uh, for country which we so deeply care about. Uh, I think that uh, Belarus uh, and Slovakia are sharing many similarities but striking differences which we need to take into consideration differences which we need to take into consideration while we are thinking about lessons learned or how and what ideas we could share with, uh, with colleagues in Belarus. Uh, I think that uh, in nine, both of our countries are newborn states. Both of our, our countries are post-communist states. Both our countries are Slavic states having some kind of mentality, which for me is striking how close we are in many aspects. Uh, if I have so many friends from Belarus, whenever I, I, I'm struck, how come that we are so close? So as far as your question, illusions, uh, is concerned, we thought after collapse of uh, communist bloc, Moscow driven Eastern bloc, we thought that we will be changing much faster than we actually did. We thought that it will take us much less time to develop rules-based society where a free market economy, democracy, human rights will be part of our life. Uh, I think in many aspects we managed and Slovakia is one of those countries which is rather big surprise and success story since we went through transition quite 
even through painful transition much faster than some other countries. And we joined the European Union and NATO in 2004. Uh, I think that we went through transition not only because of political leaders, but I think one of the lessons for people in Belarus is that uh, you need to do it hand in hand, civil society at broad sense, uh, not only NGOs, churches, free market organizations, uh, free media, church, churches. I think that besides political parties, which are going through turmoil because they are appearing, disappearing, I think that we in Slovakia were quite clear at the beginning that we want to join the West. We, we want to be like the West, meaning fully fledged democracies with free market economy. And I think that in a way we were lucky because there was window of opportunity for us to move that direction and develop this feeling of belonging to the West. Unlike you in Belarus, you found yourself in between Russia and the West. And I think that this is geopolitics matter tremendously. And while we will be discussing, and particularly Ivan Miklos, who became face of economic and political transition in our country, uh, I think that we need to remind ourselves how important it is where you belong and how you define your goals. So, I, and last but not least, it depends what kind of leaders you have. If I compare Alexander Lukashenko with Václav Havel, because you have only one president throughout the times, if I compare Alexander Lukashenko with Zuzana Chaputova, our current president, there are striking similarities between leaders. So in a way, it depends a lot what kind of leadership and political system you are developing, whether system is responsive to impulses from below or not. And I think that Alexander Lukashenko is very unusual political figure in whole Europe. Because on one hand, he is able since 1994 uh, be the leader, and he is now even uh, sort of developing brutal uh, autocratic regime, unlike what he was promising that he will do. That when you will be comparing Slovakia, which emerged from Czechoslovakia, you emerged from Soviet Union, I think it depends a lot what kind of leadership you develop both in political area, but also leadership in broader economic, civil society and other areas. But I think that through our discussion, we will be able to speak about some of these uh, similarities, differences, but last but not least, for me, Belarus is a juncture of future evolution because what people in Belarus showed uh, since last presidential elections, which catapulted Svetlana Tikhanovska among uh, remarkable political figures, uh, and she never thought that she will do that, but besides Svetlana Tikhanovska, all newborn democratic leaders emerged, most of them living now in diaspora and fighting for freedom of the country. Uh, and at the same time, Belarus per capita got the largest numbers of Sakharov prices. So European Union is with you. You are getting Sakharov Prize, as far as I remember, Jana Litvina got one for journalists, then Alexander Milenkevich got one now, Svetlana Tikhanovska and Democratic Forces got one. So you need to keep in mind that even if you go through this incredibly painful transition and dealing with your autocratic leader, uh, that European Union and the West, of which Slovakia is part of, is with you and there is great goodwill to help in this painful transition in which you are at the moment. Um, Mr. Damesh, uh, there were several circles of excitement last year when the revolution was just beginning and uh, we all observed the crackdown which happened in the aftermath of that. So according to Humorized Defenders, 
30 to 40,000 people were detained or arrested within these slightly seven, eight months. And uh, everyone is probably having this disillusionment about the, the dream that Lukashenko will be gone just like that. Yeah. Everyone expected that as soon as large audiences will pop up in, in the streets of Minsk and will call for changes, changes will happen. They are not happening. So how is this uh, experience correlating with the experience that your country went to uh, at the times when the Soviet Union and uh, the socialist bloc were collapsed? Yeah, I think that I was among those who believed that when we saw 200,000 people at squares and months and months of protest that uh, we thought that no way that uh, Lukashenko and his uh, regime with Siloviki can sustain this. So it is big surprise uh, that uh, he was able to consolidate his power using force uh, so excessively that people in Belarus were shocked and surprised and people outside of Belarus were shocked and, uh, shocked and surprised. And I think that uh, also all leadership was uh, expelled out of country and you started to operate uh, from behind the borders. I think that Lithuania and Poland in particular showed enormous openness and, and uh, open arms to help with this. Surely my country as well, our foreign minister Korchok and other political leaders, President Chaputova showed uh, big, uh, big gestures of solidarity, Globsec, and I'm sitting at Globsec. This is not my living room or bedroom uh, because we had some meeting here. So people from NGO community uh, showed enormous sympathy towards that. So I think that it was difficult to predict uh, what will happen and also how to manage the expectations. Usually on behalf of leaders, you need to see uh, capacity to develop long-term future and long-term approach and don't fool yourself that there will be a quick fix. We had these during uh, Mechiar times in 90s. Mechiar was also rather authoritarian leaders. It took us some time. And again, joint venture, public, private initiatives, eventually in 98 led to his dismissal, which opened up our chance to start and, and negotiate our membership in the EU. Uh, so in case of Belarus, I think that for leaders, it will be extremely difficult and, but at the same time important to keep hope alive and keep like-minded people who are inside the country and outside of the country together and communicate their vision of Belarus uh, to those who try to help uh, Belarus to become rules-based society, whatever type of political system you have, but majority of uh, Belarusians would like to live normal life, similar to what they see in Baltic states uh, and Poland. Surely factor Russia uh, and Putin's Russia, I think, is making huge impact uh, not on these domestic evolutions. So I think that the uh, if I would say that the lesson from our transition is think long term and stick together and consolidate both political leadership, intelligentsia, civil society at large, and achieve this mentality of making it through whatever it takes. And this is what, based on public opinion polls, what I read that Belarusian, even if they were cracked down uh, through these last couple months and number of political prisoners increased that there is still will within the country not to be beaten to the ground uh, by Lukashenko and his strong men, but rather work uh, for the future of the country, which should have similar life like uh, any other normally functioning European state. Thank you, Pavel. I have the next question to uh, Mr. Miklos. Uh, so the transition that most of post-socialist countries went through was faced with uh, unhappiness that people experienced uh, due to recession that happened 
in the aftermath of transition or in the process of transition. What kind of experiences did your country experience and what kind of recession do you think Belarus might expect uh, after the regime of Lukashenko falls? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very glad to be here in this discussion. Firstly, I'm very glad that Pavel uh, spoke uh, before me because what he stressed is uh, geopolitical orientation and geopolitical dimension of the problem is really the key. And this, I, I, I won't start with this because today, even more than before, a country can uh, either to, to, to be part of the West or to be in under control and under uh, under influence of Russia. There's impossible to be somewhere in the middle. This is simply, simply, simply reality. Which means my most important um, experience, not only my, but but of my country, was that this majority effort to become part of the West was the most important in this regard. It was the most important precondition why we overcome this uh, difficult period of the Mechiars regime. By the way, this is one very important similarity between uh, Slovakia and Belarus is that at that time, in the second half of the 90s, Mechiar and Lukashenko have been uh, the, uh, mentioned as examples of this illiberal democracy. I remember Farid Zakaria's article from that time, he mentioned also Milosevic at, at, at that time. But in Slovakia, important was that we were able to kind of uh, mobilize all the, these parts of society which felt that it is a real threat to not become the part of the West, that our neighboring countries of Visegrad for them to enter. And this was the first very important, also for answering your question, overcoming this transition recession consequences. Because the problem is that, that in any country, if you are uh, doing reforms and changing the system after a long term of deformations, there is a lot of both hidden and also open, visible, uh, dead uh, legacy, bad legacy, imbalances, and so on and so on. Which means problem of reforms and problem of revolutions in this regard are that people usually expect quick improving of the situation, but instead of this transition recession is coming. It was the same in all uh, transition countries after breakdown of communism. And by the way, another uh, different uh, another difference between Belarus and Slovakia was that Slovakia was fortunate enough to be in the first years after breakdown of communism between part of Czechoslovakia in 90 from 89 to 1993 and because of this we have we have we have been part of this radical reform approach which was firstly introduced in Poland from January 1st uh, 1990. And then from January 1st, 1991 in Czechoslovakia. Thanks to this, we overcome the most difficult period. But because of, of transition recession, we lost elections in 1992 because majority of Slovaks have been simply very, very dissatisfied with these consequences of the transition recession. But then when we again returned to power in 98, after six years of the, of the Mechiar regime, it was very important that we unified on this catching up priority to the European integration together with other countries. And we also have been politically unified to do everything necessary for fulfilling this. And this was also, which means uh, if question is what to do to overcome this transition recession, unavoidable transition recession period, the simple answer is that yes, it is unavoidable. It is politically very difficult, but the best way is to do as much as possible necessary reforms from the from the from the, from the start, from the taking power, because then you have chance that this transition recession will be as short as possible, and also positive results will will come. And this is this is what what happened. Uh, then we had, fortunately for for Slovakia, we had eight years in a row, from uh, 98 to, uh, to 2006, and we did a lot of a lot of reforms. Another very important and positive message or lesson is that if 
reforms are done real if they are prepared in advance, if there is strong enough political will, leadership, communication, then it is possible relatively quickly to overcome this difficult period and change also the image of the country and perception of the people. Well, a good example is when uh, during, uh, in the second half of the uh, 90s, during Mechiar, Slovakia was really isolated, not only geopolitically, but also economically. There is no FDI, huge corruption, and so on and so on. Madeleine Albright at the time uh, mentioned that Slovakia is, uh, she called it, black hole of Europe, which means really, really difficult situation. Then after a few years, after five, six years of, uh, of uh, Nikola Zurita's government, Slovakia became the most reformed country in the world by the, by the World Bank. And the nickname of Slovakia was changed from Black Hole of Europe to Reform Tiger. And Slovakia, thanks to these reforms and change of this image, attracted a lot of foreign direct investment. And then for people, it was clearly visible that situation is really new that they, they they become to they are part of the country which has really good image they have been proud of this then finally thanks to reforms we have we, have, we are until now still until now only country of Visegrad for which uh, introduced euro as currency and this this was very helpful of course it was uneasy it was it was difficult politically difficult uh, of course that not not everybody was was happy and so on so on people have been tired from us but Simply or briefly asking your, your, your question, what is necessary, what is the, the most important precondition for overcoming this is to be prepared, to, to have strong uh, political leadership, to have strong vision, will, and courage to do this, and to do as much as possible also to explain this to people, to communicate, and to simply, simply change the system as soon as possible. Samir Klesh, unlike many countries in Europe, Belarus has a huge portion of uh, state-owned property and a huge portion of uh, state-controlled uh, enterprises, which makes the situation pretty unique for us. And uh, in that sense, Belarus still remains a post-Soviet country in the very beginning of reforms, in the very beginning of the process of transformation. And uh, it's, it's pretty much a right thing that we may not copy someone's experience. We may not copy the experience of Ukraine and where we may not copy the experience of Slovakia, just because the, the context that Belarus has at the moment is pretty unique for the time and for the region. So I wonder, what do you think might be the first steps of the economic team of the, the Belarusian transition government um, as soon as they have an opportunity to act? And what, what should they do with the state-owned property and the state-owned enterprises? Yeah, this is, this is a very important, a very sensitive question. And I'm very glad that I'm, I'm cooperating with Alex Alakhnovich specifically on this, on, this, on this issue, which means it is very good that Belarusian experts and, and future leaders are thinking in advance about, about this. If speaking about some uh, another country's experience, Please don't take experience from Ukraine in this. I have spent five, five years in Ukraine, and Ukraine did a really, really big uh, pro progress during the last uh, six years from Euromaidan, but unfortunately not in privatization of big state-owned enterprises. They, they, have, they have progress in small privatization, but not in, in big, unfortunately, and still, they, they still have 3,500 state-owned companies. Speaking about uh, foreign experience, the most important uh, uh, lesson is that in any country, in every country, uh, privatization is a very sensitive issue, also politically very sensitive, which means it has to be really as transparent as possible, as open as possible, to give control uh, over this also to opposition, to media, to, to, to think tanks, and so on. This is the, the first. Second, if possible, it is necessary to open it also for foreign companies. Of course, if you're speaking about foreign companies, it's another sensitive issue because some companies, of course, could be dangerous, uh, open to anybody. Yeah? But in majority, in principle, foreign direct investment will be also for Belarus. It will be uh, 
impossible to, to it, it will be it will be really critically important to attract as much as possible foreign direct investment especially from the uh, developed uh, market economies and privatization is good process how to do this another important lesson is that if possible it is uh, it is necessary to think about what to give to ordinary people to normal belarusian from this because it is state owned it was it was made also by them and the best method, it seems to me, it is something similar to what they did in, in, in uh, Estonia to privatize, especially if we are speaking about big state-owned companies, important state-owned companies. If possible, politically, to sell majority stake for strategic investors by open international tenders from abroad, and then uh, give uh, minority stakes, 49% or 40%, to Belarusians through, for instance, voucher privatization, but directly to them. It is how to do this. It was. It is really possible use Czechoslovak uh, voucher system. It was really transparent, really uh, just. It was impossible to manipulate with this. I'm, I'm thinking about distribution of the shares. Yeah, uh, but but not good idea is to 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 distribute majority stakes or everything. By coupons because then you don't have this kind of strategic uh, investor and new management and so on, new markets and so on. So it, it seems to me that if politically it is possible, this kind of combination could be could be the best. And another important issue connected with this is also that if we are speaking about the reorientation of the Belarus uh, regarding politics and geopolitics. It will have to be also reorientation of the economy, which means of the foreign trade and economic cooperation. And this is also another reason why this transition period will be will be will be difficult. But privatization and entering um, foreign direct investment can really speeding up the process and to really speeding up this necessary restructuring of the, of the economy. Mr. Miklos, if I may ask, uh, since uh, early 90s, Belarusians are having this horror of privatization. And um, as of today, there's fears that if only privatization begins, much of the uh, stakes may go to Russia, and that will help Russia further control Belarusian enterprises and Belarusian politics. So I have two questions. Is there such thing as fear privatization? and how to make people believe in privatization again. Because if you say voucher in Belarus, people start shaking and they uh, just uh, are stunned with fear. Yeah, and that's the reason why I, I said uh, that it has to be as much transparent as possible, open, controlled, by public control, by control, by opposition, by, by media, by NGOs, by Transparency International and so on and so on. And, and this will be difficult. This is, this is exactly a uh, reason why, one of the reasons why in Ukraine there is no, no progress in, in large privatization. But the situation in, in, uh, in Belarus is not the same as in Ukraine. I mean, in, in uh, Belarus, the advantage of the today's situation is that you don't have such strong oligarchs who are strong economically and politically and who are the main obstacle for uh, bigger uh, progress in, in, uh, in uh, reforms in uh, Ukraine. Which means in this regard, really, it has to be open, has to be transparent. And it's OK, if speaking about voucher privatization, it was also in Ukraine. Uh, in 94, 95, they, they had uh, voucher privatization. It was a disaster. It was just another additional tool for stealing assets for oligarchs and these speculants. But in Czechoslovak voucher privatization, and I'm speaking now only about distribution of the shares. I'm not speaking about what was final result because Czechoslovak uh, voucher privatization finally from whole picture was also controversial. But if speaking only about this part of the distribution of the shares in Czechoslovak, it was really transparent, really just, there was no manipulation. And that's the reason why if I'm speaking about how to use this method in Belarus, I'm speaking not about privatization funds, which many of them misuse their position. I'm not speaking about privatization of whole stakes of the, of the shares by this method, but just in these companies in which you have at the same time on or, or before a strategic investor. 
who is uh, taking care about uh, management, about markets, and and so and, and all these these uh, issues. And then, of course, another issue is that you can change also the management of the state-owned companies. You can create independent supervisory board. You can hire their experts and also foreigners, and you can hire management for uh, these companies and so on. So on. There, is, there is also possibility, but openly speaking. I don't believe I'm not supporter. I, I think a privatization is is much better solution as trying to change change corporate governance in state-owned companies because still it is it is much less effective and more risky business. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I have a, uh, one more question to Mr. Damish, if I may ask. So it's obviously a clear thing that. Moscow is a lot closer to Minsk than Bratislava and the influence of Russia is a lot bigger. In today's situation, the keys from the solution to the Belarus stalemate probably lay down in somewhere in the Kremlin's room. So how do you think uh, Russia can be convinced and personally Vladimir Putin as the ruler of the Kremlin can be convinced to uh, stop support for Lukashenko because if only we look retrospectively on the events of the past seven months, the crackdown, the, the, the second wave of crackdown that began in September started with the open support of the Kremlin for Lukashenko and his activities. So my question is, do you think there's certain way for the West uh, to influence the Kremlin today. Microphone, Pablo. Na ten mikrofonik vlavo dole musíš kliknúť. Vlavo dole. Ale ja mám... No, it's work. No, it's working now. It's okay, working perfect, now. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Now, I think it's extremely difficult question, but I think that uh, one thing is sure that for Belarus, uh, for Russia, Belarus is... Uh, in their sphere of influence, the politically wise uh, security services work together, economic intertwining. I think that you are two countries which are so close, not only politically uh, and militarily, but also psychologically, culturally, still Russian language is dominant language and, uh, and parallel to, Bel uh, to your uh, state language, Russian is still there. People are uh, having many relatives go and work in Russia and so on. So in foreseeable future, one I can hardly see that which... Belarus will evolve or move similar way as Ukraine did from Russia. Because uh, I remember in 90s, Russian speaking, Ukrainian, Russian was normal language for them to speak. Nowadays, they refuse to speak Russian. And uh, many Russians can't even travel through Ukraine because of Crimea and Donbas and all of this. So, uh, Belarusians do not have anti Russian sentiment. But at the same time, they see that due to Russian politics, Lukashenko is surviving such a long time and is keeping uh, their homeland detached from cooperation from neighboring countries like Poland, Baltic states and others. Because at the beginning, Belar uh, Belarus was very advanced, part of Soviet Union and the standard of living was higher than in Poland. And now when they see what's going on there, 
So I think that psychology and diffusion of lifestyle from Poland and, and Baltics in particular is keeping Belarusians uh, fully aware how politics is changing standard of living and way of living, what freedom of movement is all about, uh, or versus isolation within which Belarus is due to policies of, uh, of Lukashenko, who is what has been bluffing between Russia and the West very masterfully throughout the years. So my feeling is that if Belarusians will show that their mind is already independent, that no chance that this will be gubernia-like state for Russia, if young generation will very clearly state uh, that they want to maintain statehood, statehood is such a precious thing for them that they are willing to sacrifice. If large parts of society will be willing to show clear distinction from Russia and the Russian way of thinking and politics, I think that Russia will be nervous to, to step in because Russia is having enough troubles, not only with COVID, but many other things. And last week's, uh, uh, last week's speech by President Vladimir Putin, when he was constantly reminding that there are some red lines and Russia will not tolerate, Russia will do this, Russia will do that. I think that Russia is getting more and more isolated in international arena. And I think that for people in Belarus, it is critically important in whatever difficult circumstances you have to keep in mind your future and try to find the ways of maintaining hope that if you will work hard, that country will be open to work broad co international cooperation and country will have different political, social model than what you have now and what you see in Russia. Surely what Ivan Miklos was saying that how to get from A to B and Z, you know, how to change and how to privatize, how to develop pluralistic politics, you know, it takes time. And in your case, since you were frozen, and your party politics and political pluralism haven't developed at all, in your case, it will be extremely difficult to parallelly run political transformation, economic transformation, social transformation, and also developing new links with countries with which you freely can decide to move. Surely Russia will, for foreseeable and long future, remain critical factor in your politics and, and uh, in your life of your state, but to moving into position where you will be able freely define way of public affairs and ways of international affairs, these should be kept alive and allow Lukashenko to depart and open up uh, this maturation process for new Belarus, which is so critical. But at the moment, we are still discussing like dream because you are still not there yet. And I think that even if Ivan and myself are trying to tell you what we did in 90s, what we did now and what we are doing now, there is still two big elephant in the room, uh, Bačka Lukashenka and uh, who thinks that uh, his, uh, his son probably will be a good successor or uh, how he will rescue himself still from... Uh, so I think that we are still in a process, even haven't, you haven't even started any transition from Lukashenko to something. So in a way, it is a bit hypothetical discussion what we are having because I think that both of us would feel more comfortable if you would be asking the question, okay, Lukashenko is no more president. We can have free and fair elections. How would you think free and fair elections should be conducted? How do you think privatization should be? How do you think that the West should now try to come and learn 
about your country and develop based on your own political circumstances future. So for the time being, we still have brutality of uh, unthinkable magnitude. If a year ago we would be discussing whether number of political prisoners and atrocities, what we saw, we would see, we would say that no, Lukashenko will never do this. Or we would say that according to our own assessment in other countries, if you have 100,000 people in streets, usually Robert Fico, who was in power, and people here in 1918, when journalists and his fiance was killed, we started protesting and we were 60,000 people and so on. Government said, okay, enough. And there was shift in premiership. In yes, but Mr. Damash, you're talking about a democratic country and uh, we're considering Belarus as a country which has fallen into a military junta, a country yeah. where close to 40,000 people were arrested, 40,000 people left the country, fled it, and are in fact refugees without having this legal status sure. officially, without being registered as refugees. But it's a, it's a huge workforce that left Absolutely. the country. Many people continue living. And uh, it seems pretty much obvious that Lukashenko is not willing to go, that he is building up sort of a sultanistic uh, regime or military junta, uh, which might have this um, family ties and fam family uh, heritage transferred, I mean, the, the presidential position uh, transferred as family heritage from father to, to son and so on and so on. And uh, so far, we've experienced up to 200,000 people participating in, in, in a single meeting in Minsk, yeah. uh, close to 1.2 million people participating in meetings all across the country, according to Chatham House, which didn't work. And uh, what Lukashenko is doing now is definitely the beheading of all civil society. This is what his so-called uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mackay, threatens the Western countries with. So I wonder if there's a peaceful solution to this situation from within the country and whether there's certain instruments that the West still has to influence the Russians and stop Lukashenko. Because without Russian support, the whole situation ends pretty fast. For as long as Putin supports Lukashenko, it may continue for decades. Yeah, I think that realistically speaking, uh, important thing happened in White House. I think that Biden's administration will be much tougher and more open towards a uh, situation like in Belarus. So democracy agenda, freedom agenda will become more prominent for American politics. For European Union, I. I think that surely there is unanimous response that this is unacceptable at the borders with EU having regime like this. But uh, to be honest, uh, for the time being, I don't see too much uh, uh, short term solutions given to you uh, to change the situation. Th this change is expected to be homegrown uh, through a lot of pain, surely there are new schemes of helping uh, people from civil society or uh, those who political leaders who try to bring the change but uh, but abnormal regime which we see which self isolated itself i i don't simply see that eu has some specific tools and methods to press change it will rather help the way it can. And uh, then more massive, uh, more massive help can be expected through Marshall Plan-like situation when there will be openness. Uh, so far, we are stuck because on one hand, country, it's criminal if you are helping in country, it is uh, not allowed. So EU, EU just simply doesn't have any, any more powers which we so far used to assist. So solidarity was strong, financial assistance for civil society and political actors of some degree is given and shown. I think that 
one new opening may occur if the United States and European Union would think together how to be more strategic in dealing with Moscow vis-a-vis uh, neighbors like Ukraine, Belarus, and Eastern Partnership countries in general. So I think that this transatlantic uh, uh, coordination of activities vis-a-vis -vis Belarus and other Eastern Partnership countries is, I think, window of opportunity after change in the White House. But we would be spreading false expectations if we would say that in one year things can change because EU and US will do this or, or the West will do this or that. I think that bargaining power of Russia or uh, it's much uh, stronger than, uh, than what West has and we need to live in realism and work within circumstances what we have surely trying to enrich uh, tools and methods, but all in all, I think that the uh, situation doesn't look uh, promising. And we will see what Lukashenko, who said that next year there will be some constitutional change, that he may allow some more free elections and so on. But again, he was saying so many times what he will allow and not allow. I was there observing two presidential elections, and I never seen in my life such a political theater as presidential elections uh, made in Belarus. So I think I assume I assume we will see even more of a theater in the upcoming months with the so-called constitutional reform, which is nothing but theater in the essence. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Demesh. I would like to move to uh, Mr. Alex Alekhnovich, uh, our honorable guest, uh, who is a Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's economic advisor. Uh, Alex, we met with you just recently for ISENS talks, but I, I still want to ask you, what do you think are the most necessary reforms that um, Belarus should undertake in the upcoming months? And uh, what do you think are the first steps that uh, the cabinet of Svetlana Tikhanovska should do as soon as she comes back to the country? Thanks, Serge, and uh, thank you everyone, for uh, the organizers for organizing this uh, seminar. It's my pleasure to participate uh, in it together with so many distinguished guests. Um, before I move to, to, to your question uh, about uh, the most needed economic reforms, I would like to explain that the economic situation uh, currently is, uh, is not catastrophic, but the, the economic growth perspectives are very doomed. Uh, in particular, the, the, the Belarusian economy has been stagnant for a long time. Uh, we can call it the last decade because uh, the economic growth in the past decade in Belarus was below 1% on average annually, while Poland, Slovakia, uh, the global uh, economy on average uh, grew by three to 4%, so much, uh, much stronger. And the prospects for uh, this year and the next years um, is um, the gap between the Belarusian economy growth and uh, the global economic growth is, um, is huge. It's around six percentage points. So, for example, the World Bank uh, projects that the Belarusian GDP will fall by 2% this year and the global GDP will grow by 4%. So it shows that um, Belarus was, in, uh, was stagnating before, even before the presidential elections. Currently, after the presidential elections and after this political crackdown against the, the, the society, the perspectives are much worse. Uh, there are many uh, macroeconomic indicators showing that the situation is deteriorating. Public debt is growing, public deficit uh, is uh, growing, uh, inflation is rising, GDP is stagnating, uh, wages, pensions, and so on in hard currency uh, um, are not growing. Uh, so, in such situation, uh, it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of time when the um, the the current regime will lead the economy to the collapse. Already now, uh, the Belarusian regime can count only on Russia. 
It cannot count even on China because China behaved neutrally in the current political crisis. Obviously, international financial markets and the West uh, is close for, for the cooperation with the, uh, with the state in Belarus. And actually, uh, one comment to, uh, to Pavel Damos, I, I really believe that the EU can make much more than it, it's doing right now, including uh, it has um, such instruments like stopping um, buying oil products from Belarus, which, uh, which uh, gives almost 20% of Belarusian exports, uh, merchandise exports. Um, we don't know what will be the, uh, situ the situation in economy when uh, the political crisis will be solved. Probably it will be much worse than it is right now. So I'm saying it because just to explain that the uh, reforms might be might be a little bit different, in different starting uh, point. But in general, the two um, there should be two packages of reforms. One is let, let's call it anti-crisis or macroeconomic stabilization program, and another part is the institutional uh, reforms. Uh, the vision of the institutional reforms was already announced in October, uh, signed by over 60 economists, uh, renowned economists from Belarus and abroad, including, uh, including Ivan Miklos, uh, including myself. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, economists will be working under this uh, Slovak aid fellowship program on developing these uh, institutional reforms framework. Um, Answering your question, what are the most important uh, reforms? In terms of institutional reforms, I will uh, name three, three of them. The first one is not actually economic one, but it is very important for the economy. It is the independency of a judiciary system. It's very important for Belarus to renew uh, the belief of uh, the society to, uh, to state institutions and to the judiciary system. In particular, the second uh, important uh, reform, as pre pre preceding to all other reforms, is the um, the, uh, the reform of uh, social policy in Belarus. For example, right now, uh, the person who is the, the the social policy is not addressed enough. For example, uh, people. Um, who are losing their jobs, they receive in Belarus from 10 to $20 per month. It's impossible to live under such money. And this is why uh, many people are, uh, um, they, um, they, they are afraid of losing their jobs, even if these jobs are not uh, very much paid, but because they have no savings, they cannot count on the, uh, the unemployment benefits and they are still staying where they are. So this is the second uh, important reform. And the third important reform is uh, the reform of uh, the state-owned enterprise sector, something that even Miklos already mentioned. Uh, these are three most important uh, issues for Belarus. Thank you, Alice. Uh, I have another question for Veronica. Um, what do you think should be done with the uh, political reforms? There's so much told about the reforms that must happen regarding the constitution, which we've already touched upon slightly uh, a few minutes ago with uh, Mr. Demish. This would likely be a, a figure, a manipulation to show reforms without actually doing them. But what do you think should be the first steps done to really start the reforms, to really start the political life and to improve the situation with the media, because today we see a huge portion of state-owned media, which are de facto privatized by a single oligarch, Alexander Lukashenko, and work for his own benefit, not in the public good. Although they're all funded publicly, they in fact work as private media supporting a single person, a single candidate, and a single politician. What do you think can be done in these fields, uh, in uh, the field of political reforms and in the field of media reform for Belarus? Thank you very much, Serge, for a question. And I would like uh, once again to thank um, uh, Slovak people, Slovak journalists, Slovak politicians, uh, bloggers, 
who have been supporting Belarusians in so many ways since August. Um, not only Slavic independent media like uh, Denik N and Tomasz Bela were reaching out to us, but even um, Slovak uh, important political influencers like Zomri, my friends, who were spreading out information by social media, what is happening and um, enlightening Slovak people of what was the matter of facts and what were the atrocities happening in here. And thank you very much, uh, Pavel and Ivan, for participating in this project. And thank you so much, Globsec and Slovak Aid, for uh, your effort and uh, for all your uh, contribution to uh, to build up a new reality, new future for Belarusian people. Um, I'm really happy that Alesh has mentioned um, their, one of their uh, crucial things which should be changed in Belarus, which is reforms of the judiciary system. I think that uh, this is one of the, of the pillars of our democratic um, our mechanism should definitely uh, be reformed in Belarus and without this, not any other uh, really element can uh, become operational again. Um, also, uh, I, I would cite here uh, Pavel Demos who said about the elections. I think that uh, elections overall, uh, which uh, have been uh, rigged and uh, falsified for so many years, uh, according to many international reports of IDEA, of uh, Council of Europe, of uh, Parliamentary Assembly, of um, other organizations who stated openly that there have been many uh, things which were are not working or um, simply um, not uh, uh, demonstrating the truth, the true results. So I think this is one of their element which also has to be uh, reformed, worked around, and I know that a lot of people are now involved into also this element. In terms of the media, um, I really uh, believe that uh, Belarusians and Belarusian media have been working since, especially of course for all these years, but especially since August 2020, in almost wartime uh, conditions, um, when uh, they were specifically targeted by the right, right police, when uh, independent media organizations have been so many times searched and uh, repressed, uh, we know that at the moment, uh, um, around seven, uh, seven, six bloggers are in jail in Belarus. Many of them were on hunger strikes, like Igor Losik who has been also consulting Radio Free uh, Europe Radio Liberty, uh, Belarusian services in Minsk. Uh, so uh, in this regard, I think we also need to uh, take uh, the best experiences of uh, what has been happening in Slovakia and uh, uh, see how uh, we can uh, continue to support media, how to provide consultancies to work on monetization of media. Uh, to work on uh, um, development of uh, different mechanisms which are working really well in Slovakia. And here, once again, I will um, I mention Denny Khan, an independent media outlet which has grown, um, just been based on subscription, on donations of uh, readers, and even spread the influence uh, to Czechia. Um, I think that um, for me, also personally, um, the murder of Jan Kucek and his uh, fiance Martina Kushnirova in 2018 was a wake up call for Slovak civil society and for Slovak politicians. And I think that in many ways, uh, the victims of uh, the regime, uh, we know that there are around 10 of them on, um, on different uh, ways of how we kind of consider the news from official and unofficial, whether these were real victims or not. Uh, would be something similar and they would um, start a new um, chapter of the Belarusian history, but this never happened. And as you are uh, rightly are sad, Serge, that's of course because uh, Belarus has um, an authoritarian regime in place and uh, unfortunately uh, hundreds of thousands of protesters didn't uh, make uh, the elites uh, realize that they should leave and they should go. But um, I think that these similarities, which we have in a way with the Slovakia and also this um, comprehensive and omnipresent solidarity uh, Belarusians feel all the time coming from Slovakia, show that um, 
this is a good example for us to follow. And in many ways, uh, this feeling of empathy, which exists between Slovak people and Belarusian people in many spheres, can be really beneficial, can contribute a lot in what uh, we're doing there in terms of our plans so for how uh, Belarusian future will uh, work. Um, overall, I do believe that uh, also in terms of political reforms overall, um, it might be um, not uh, that uh, smooth as we think it, it will be. But on the other hand, because we will be learning from many of our European uh, partners and friends uh, from uh, Visegrad countries, from Baltic states, uh, we have a lot of chances to not to make mistakes in both politics and economy, which have been made by them, and also taking into consideration their level of um, uh, maturity of Belarusian society in terms of understanding and acceptance of democratic values and um, uh, also uh, free market economy values and free media and the respect to free media. Belarusians have very big chances to, uh, to actually evolve into a different kind of country in a very rapid way. And I do hope that um, this program will be part of this. And I do hope that our cooperation with our Slovak partners will contribute to this a lot. So this is my opinion on that. Thanks. Do you think there are certain prerequisites for creation of really public television and not just a network or a few networks of private television that might serve the goal of um, competition within the media field after the um, beginning of the transformations? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I do support the idea of um, public television and it's working very well. For instance, in Ukraine, in Ukraine there are some uh, obstacles, of course, some problems there. But uh, due to the fact that Ukraine has to adhere to the um, uh, requirements imposed by the Council of Europe and European Union in this regard, uh, they have this kind of internal uh, limitations which they cannot cross and they really trying to make this happen, make this work. And as um, Ivan Miklos said, uh, the uh, benefit and the advantage of Belarus is that we don't have uh, such a uh, network of oligarchic uh, um, segments. We, for instance, in Ukraine, each oligarch has pretty much one or two really big major channels. We don't have this in Belarus. So we kind of can overcome this uh, risk and without actually going into this problem of division of uh, mass media between oligarchs, we can actually start with a quite uh, well-established system of public media. Of course, this has to be uh, controlled and oversee overseen uh, by our European uh, partners. Um, also can be Slovakia uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also developing, which we also already have on quite a good level, um, the um, network of uh, independent media and uh, including the regional media, which in many cases are very important in Belarus and which also demonstrated during uh, this whole month of protests how engaged they were. Uh, how um, it can be proved by the fact that Belarusian authorities have been also arresting a lot of regional journalists and uh, they've been searching their offices because they know that the local media uh, remain very important, uh, especially in certain towns and um, uh, villages of Belarus. So I, I, in this regard, I think we actually have uh, quite a good chances here also to reform this part of uh, our uh, society, our system. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, I have one more question for Elias. Um, the team of Svetlana Tikhanovska expected to start uh, the talks with the uh, absent regime in Minsk uh, in May, which begins in just a few days, and uh, it seems like there is no movement on that matter. Uh, what economic measures do you think might push uh, the acting regime to agree for such peace talks? Um, there is no one um, successful instrument for this. It should be a package of uh, different instruments, including internal uh, pressure and uh, from Belarusian citizens and also external pressure. 
in terms of uh, external pressure, which is probably more interesting for our guests here, uh, there are also several um, such steps. Uh, one of it is um, uh, is um, stopping any cooperation with the state, apart from humanitarian reasons, obviously. Uh, so, for example, EBRD and the European Investment Bank uh, have already uh, done this. Um, but there are more institutions, including the World Bank, including the IMF, including the International Financial Corporation, including uh, some cooperation between uh, countries. Second instrument is to stop uh, cooperation or stop uh, financing Belarusian uh, banks. Uh, primarily state-owned banks, but also banks uh, connected to so-called forces of Lukashenko. Uh, and uh, this is the second instrument. The third instrument is to, um, to stop issuing new uh, public bonds at international financial markets. Um, this is all, all, this is not done formally, but practically I don't believe any um, huge investment bank will uh, will cooperate with the Belarusian state on this, and I don't believe that any uh, large uh, investment funds will also buy such bonds, new bonds. Um, fourth uh, mechanism is to um, to make a pressure from uh, the corporate sector on the Belarusian uh, state-owned enterprises where. Uh, the repressions against um, the, the workers, against the employees, um, are still conducted. So it's still possible to stop uh, stop working with, uh, for example, um, large industrial plants in Belarus, with the oil refineries, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with uh, with some um, some uh, companies and. Uh, and the direct uh, direct control of the uh, administration of president. Uh, so there are at least several such mechanisms that can be done. And um, when many um, many experts or many people are criticizing that the sanctions are not working against the uh, against Belarus, it is because the sanctions are not there yet. If if you don't have sanctions and uh, so far, uh, in terms of economic sanctions, they are insufficient and they are quite a little, especially when we talk about uh, targeted economic sanctions from the EU. Uh, they are really uh, not there yet. And uh, they cannot, if you compare them with uh, economic pressure and the economic sanctions after the uh, presidential elections in 2010, after crackdown in 2010, then you will see that uh, the economic pressure 10 years ago was much much higher than it is right now, although you cannot compare the political crackdown that is in Belarus right now. There are two specific areas that um, European countries continue to uh, deal with uh, Belarus, uh, namely tobacco sales and uh, oil refineries. So now we're having this sort of upcoming crisis within the, the oil refineries field. And uh, the, the latest news is that one of the top managers of uh, uh, one of two refineries is planning a trip to Poland to agree about certain conditions of how the oil will be sold to Poland. There are still no measures taken on the uh, tobacco industry and uh, uh, the sanctions against tobacco producers despite huge smuggling problem that uh, Belarusian companies create for uh, European states, in particular the UK, Netherlands, Poland, and Lithuania. Uh, do you think there will be certain measures uh, to stop trade within these fields and to uh, introduce sanctions against tobacco producers? I don't have such um, insider information on, on this particular issue. Um, so I, I don't want to speculate here, but um, unfortunately, the, the situation shows once again that uh, for Belarusians and as for many other 
people in the world. It's very important to to make the history with your own hands. It's it's not we, we as Belarusians should not wait that somebody abroad will uh, will solve all our issues. We should put the pressure ourselves and 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 hope that the international community will support us. So I will I will change the focus that uh, the first player should should be the Belarusian society uh, and the second should be the international community. Thank you very much. One of the reasons we gathered here today and one of the reasons we are discussing all these issues is the Slovak Aid Fellowship Program for Change Leaders, which is a joint initiative of Slovak Foreign Policy Association, GLOBSAC, Institute for Public Affairs, Slovak Aid, and uh, International Expert Initiative, ISENSE. So uh, within this program in April, October 2021, 10 Belarusian specialists uh, will uh, research the systemic reforms in Slovakia and join academic training at leading Slovak think tanks and institutions. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Pavel Demesh uh, why this program is launched now and uh, what's the purpose and expectations of this program on the Slovak side? I think that Slovakia, similar to other European countries which are free and democratic, wants to do something to help uh, to resolve this huge injustice which is taking place uh, throughout decades uh, in country, which is in direct neighborhood. So there is moral obligation on our side uh, and uh, much more moral than any political and business in our case. Uh, and I think that nowadays political leaders in our country, ranging from president through prime minister, foreign minister, up to other uh, political actors, civil society, which throughout years developed links with their counterparts, somehow feel that we need to think how we can help. Because as Alice said, that there are many things what we can do, but, uh, and uh, you mentioned as economist, uh, raffinery products and so on. I'm hearing this for 25 years that these would be key to success. But well, there is something like political will. And if you don't have political will, United uh, European Union operates on principle of consensus. And you will have always some members which will don't agree. So this program is one of the things what we believe uh, both public and private actors can do to your country to help young uh, leaders from various walks of life to learn uh, how we did it and learn from technical things. But at the end of the day, this is your home and you are responsible to do that. In 90s, when, as uh, Ivan Miklos was saying, when we were labeled black hole, we were not waiting that somebody will come and fix black hole to white hole or something else. We needed to find strength and energy from within and fight for that. And uh, once we resolved our situation, that country became free and open for communication. Uh, I think that then we had this takeoff and suddenly, uh, I mean, oxygen came to country and, and people believe that we can be like Austria or any other country uh, in the West. So I think that this program is small drop in your enormous effort, what you are trying to do, those of you back at home and those of you who were expelled from home, uh, which none of us ever had this situation. So I think that your main uh, task is to develop new level of patriotism and convince critical mass of people that you need to work together to achieve this dream of having a free country. And I think that independence of Belarus and freedom within Belarus are two critical issues. Rest of it will follow. Uh, and there are many technical issues which can be then learned not only from Slovakia, but from other European countries. But at the same, for the time being, you need to continue to show your bravery, dedication, commitment. And if you do it, you will always find friends and partners 
not only in this country, but in many other countries in the democratic world, which will be trying to help you. But first of all, it's your country. Lukashenko is made in Belarus. Uh, he was not catapulted from some other country to your state. Surely Russia, how they deal with Crimea, Donbas or Navalny are showing you what kind of methodologies they are capable of. Uh, so we shouldn't live in some naive, ideal world, but take into consideration your domestic situation, external situation, and we will see how Germany will change after Angela Merkel. So I think that we let's hope that uh, Germany, uh, which is the strongest European country, will still stick similarly like Angela Merkel towards this principled position. Uh, and as I said, uh, new American administration shows uh, dedication, commitment. So all in all, I think that we need to look at what we have at hands and how and what we could do together and I think that those fellows which will be included into this program, I think could be not only enriched by some of technicalities, be it media work, economic, political transition, communication and so on, but I expect that you will become messengers of hope because this commodity will be of critical importance in long journey, which uh, Belarus uh, uh, has ahead. Thank you, Mr. Demish. I want to ask the same question to Mr. Miklos. What are your expectations of uh, this fellowship program and uh, what are your hopes for the expansion of the channels of communication between think tanks such as yours and uh, think tanks in Belarus? Yeah, to, to add what Pavel said, uh, it is very important for us also to return uh, something that is a part of this, what was what was done for us and to us in the 90s, for instance. Uh, we know how important for was for Slovakian NGOs, including Mesatem, this uh, think tank, which was created in 92. And during 90, from 92 until 98, during these six years of mature regime, without uh, support from, at that time, especially from American and uh, Western and European, especially German foundations and uh, donors and supporters, we couldn't survive, which means we survive only thanks to them. And we created, we, we used the time, all this time of the mature regime, and nobody knew how long it will, it will take, but we use it for creation of these think tanks, for shaping public opinion in favor of necessary changes, for preparing the technical part of necessary reforms, which haven't been done at that time, but we hoped and we expected that time will come when we will be able to, to use this uh, experience, this knowledge and this, this effort. Uh, which means I think uh, it, it proved us this how important it was for my country, for Slovakia, for these particular NGOs. And I hope and I, I, I fully uh, agree what Pavel, Pavel said about the importance of these values. Values and these, these values and principles are important of the freedom of the open society, of the, the market economy, of the free and fair competition is important because we know and we see that the, there are and there will be never ending fight for, for against those who are trying to, to destroy this, which are represented not only by, by Putin's regime, but in, in longer, uh, maybe even, even more uh, dangerous threat could be also, also Chinese. China in the in, in future, which means it is important not only from the point of view of Belarus and Slovakia, it is much more important also from the broader perspective, the fight uh, against the enemies of freedom, enemies of uh, uh, open society and, and normal coexistence. Thank you very much. With these thoughts in mind, I think uh, it's a good time for us to wrap up. I would like to again thank, uh, thank all of your distinguished guests, Mr. Pavel Demesh, JMF Senior Transatlantic Fellow, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovakia, Mr. Ivan Miklos, former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of the Slovak Republic, as well as President of Economic Think Tank, Mesa 10, Mr. Alessi Lachnovic, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's Economic Advisor, and Ms. Svetlana uh, I'm so sorry, Ms. Veronika Laputska, co-founder of East Center Warsaw and research fellow at GMF uh, Rethink CEE. 
I hope that uh, this small conversation is uh, is the beginning of great uh, series of briefings that we will have in the future, in the upcoming months, in relation to Slovakia Fellowship. Uh, I would like to thank you again for being with us, and I wish you all a great day. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Virginia Belarus. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.